Today we're talking about a patriotic hero who looked up to Steve Rogers, Captain America, a kid who became a hero in his own right, whose destiny took him from the streets of America into space and the very edges of time and reality, fighting alongside some of the biggest, most powerful beings in the Marvel Universe. Today is all about Jack Flagg. Jack Harrison first appeared in 1994's Captain America issue 434 by Mark Gruenwald and Dave Hoover, featured right on the cover, front and center. When we first meet Jack, he's a 19-year-old kid from Sand Haven, Arizona and a big fan and supporter of Captain America. He supported Captain America's Stars and Stripes program and this program was a way to help get more people in contact with Cap and the purpose of the program was to help Cap with triaging requests for aid. In fact it was set up as a hotline where people could call in and the program members would then relay intel and inform Rogers of the nature of the incoming requests. The later iteration of the team included Jack Flagg, Free Spirit, Zachary Moonhunter who became Captain America's pilot, along with the mechanics and computer expert named Fabian Stankowicz. Captain America's girlfriend Diamondback was also associated with Stars and Stripes. Jack and his brother Drake decided to make and wear costumes and face masks and they started the Citizen Patrol Group where they became vigilantes and took on crime in their hometown. But the underworld pushed back and attacked, wounding Drake and crippling him below the waist. To make it worse, a criminal organization known as the Serpent Society targeted the Harrisons and even took over their home, turning it into their own private resort. Jack took up weightlifting and learning martial arts training for 12 hours a day and then updated his costume, which was now inspired by the American flag in Captain America, which included dyeing his hair the colors of the American flag. He also used a boombox that could shoot lasers that his brother Drake designed for him, which they called the Combat Boombox. Jack ended up fighting Rock Python and Fertilance of the Serpent Society when they were trying to rob a bank in town. By the time they left the bank, Jack had already deflated all of the tires on their getaway car, and the distraction was just what Jack needed to get off a well-aimed shot with his boombox at Rock Python's coils, forcing them to wrap around Rock Python and immobilize him. He then leapt at Ferdy and hit her with a muscle relaxing gas. And just as Jack took her down, King Cobra and the rest of the Serpent Society showed up and surrounded Jack. Instead of fighting them, Jack told KC that he wanted to join the Serpent Society, but King Cobra was suspicious and he certainly wouldn't have the patriotic outfit in his group. They knocked Jack out and they headed back to the Serpent Society headquarters and lair. On the Serpent Society's helicopter, King Cobra sensed Jack's treachery, so to call his bluff, he sent him out to rob from another villain named Mr. Hyde. King Cobra wanted him to steal a painting from Mr. Hyde. When Jack left to go do this though, King Cobra called and alerted Mr. Hyde that Jack was inbound. In that battle, since Hyde was waiting for him, he got the jump on Jack and Hyde beat and severely wounded Jack. As Mr. Hyde beat Jack and he was clearly losing, Jack grabbed a vial of chemicals and threw them at Mr. Hyde, but Jack was also covered, doused in the chemicals too. The very same formula that gave Mr. Hyde his strength. And this happened just as Jack managed to escape outside to call into Captain America's hotline. From those chemicals, Jack developed superhuman strength. Jack was able to defeat Mr. Hyde. He then took the rolled up painting back to King Cobra in Scottsdale, Arizona and threw it at him poolside. King Cobra was impressed and so he let him try out to take on the King Cobra mantle next. He even got provisional status as a member of the Serpent Society when this happened. This was the opportunity that they needed to take down the society so Jack teamed up with both Captain America and Free Spirit to defeat the Serpent Society. Free Spirit defeated Coach Whip, took on her disguise, and tried to infiltrate the Serpent Society. So you had fake Coach Whip, which was Free Spirit, and fake King Cobra, which was Jack Flagg. The pair continued to escape and evade the Society even while they pursued them through the backyards and over fences in the neighborhood. Rattler got off a shot with his rattling gun that hit Jack in the ankle and numbed his leg. And just as Rattler was about to take them out, Hank Pym of the Avengers showed up, grew large to his giant man size, and hit Rattler with a giant, literally, uppercut. Following this kerfuffle, Captain America had a heart attack and collapsed in the desert outside of town, which is where Giant Man found him. Meanwhile, Jack Flagg and Free Spirit continued to battle the Serpent Society back in Arizona. They held their own long enough for Scarlet Witch to show up with a backup team in the form of Force Works, which comprised of her, US Agent, Spider Woman, and Sentry. They took down the Serpent Society and Force Works took them into custody. Jack and Free Spirit talked after the battle, both agreeing that they needed to make sure Captain America was okay, and this is when she said, quick question, what's with the hair? Captain America was now 95% paralyzed and started using an advanced armor suit in order to be mobile. Cap knew he didn't have long and intended to go out with his boots on, still fighting, still a hero. Free Spirit called Zack and so Zack flew by and picked up Jack and Kathy with Cap's Quinjet. Airborne, they got an alert that Flag Smasher was attacking Washington DC, so they headed there thinking Cap was still off the board and were immediately intercepted by Flag Smasher's ultimatum goons. Cap's Quinjet was on course to crash right into the Washington Monument and so both Jack and Free Spirit had to 
eject. Luckily, Cap was also in town, now with his new suit, which also gave him flight abilities. After the battle, Captain America updated the team on his status, and he told them that he did not know how much time he had left, and told them with his last couple weeks, he wanted them to all help him. Jack stayed with them, and they all ended up hanging out and training together at Captain America's stronghold in Brooklyn Heights in New York. They also got help from S.H.I.E.L.D. agents Peggy Carter and Valentina De La Fontaine. For Cap's next mission, Nick Fury as S.H.I.E.L.D. said he'd give Cap's team as much ordnance as they needed, but not manpower, since the mission was officially unsanctioned. Cap was still paralyzed, however, Diamondback had gone to Superior, and Superior found Steve a cure for his condition. When their friend Arnie Roth collapsed due to the severity of his bone cancer, the team, including Jack, went to visit him in the hospital, and this is when Falcon and Nick Fury picked them up with a S.H.I.E.L.D. jet. They all set off on their latest mission was to stop AIM on a Caribbean island called Boca Caliente, as they had picked up some energy spikes, leading them to believe AIM had a cosmic cube in their possession. It was also the same place where AIM had MODOK and a female MODOK named Modon, ready to bring to bear on any adversaries who dared mess with their plans. Cap, Jack, and Free Spirit donned respirators to make a water infiltration, while Zack and Fabian went to the other side of the island to stage for a release of their robot army. Cap was aware that he was bringing youngsters into battle with him, heroes without a lot of experience under their belts, but he'd already done this in the past with Rick Jones and Bucky Barnes, so ultimately he was okay with it. On the island, Jack and Free Spirit were tasked with taking out the security center, and just as they were getting ready to hit the guards, an armored Red Skull showed up and shot them before disappearing inside the facility. They both ended up putting on the AIM uniforms to hide themselves. While Cap's armor failed and he lay on the island, paralyzed, Superior snuck by and stuck him with a sample of her serum. That was happening while Jack and Kathy battled more AIM guards, without realizing they were shape-shifting adaptoids, and so they battled an adaptoid version of Rhino. They decided the best way to get inside was to fake being defeated, and so the adaptoids picked them up and carried them right to AIM's command center. On the monitors in the center, they saw the Avengers fighting. They saw Cap now healed, and on another screen, MODOK was now attacking too. Two of the AIM adaptoids took on the forms of Jack Flag and Free Spirit, though AIM's Mr. Brannix told them to remove them from the command center and eliminate them. So they ended up fighting with the green versions of themselves and took them out with their own weapons. They were headed for the security center, but stopped when lasers started shooting out of the floor as a defense mechanism. They went outside and saw Cap and Falcon battling an adaptoid version of Beetle, and they went to render aid just as Superior and Snapdragon strolled by. Jack and Free Spirit worked to save the villagers on what turned out to be a fake island with the help from Snapdragon, who, I should mention, is Rachel Layton, aka Diamondback. She had to serve Superior in this role since the serum to fix Steve Rogers had worked, and this was part of her payment. Back in Brooklyn Heights, Cap stopped Jack and Kathy's workout to say they did well on the AIM island, that he wasn't sure they were ready, but they proved themselves, and so he was proud of what they did. Cap told them not to go down the same path he did, to be so focused on the work that they forgot how to live, so he told them to take leave. Free said she didn't want to go out with her rainbow-haired goofball, and he said being seen with a perky sorority sister would put a crimp in his image. Cap made them leave anyway to go have fun. He didn't want to see them for at least 12 hours. Jack and Kathy went to Central Park to spend their free time, but denying orders, still kept their costumes on. They had a spat where Free called Jack a jerk for not considering Steve's grave condition and not planning for if and when Cap wasn't around anymore. Their disagreement, though, was cut short by none other than the maniacal Madcap. Madcap had an explosive belt strapped to himself, and he wanted to blow himself up, having lost his will to live. Jack put Madcap in a full Nelson, but he still managed to hit the button, and they both blew up. Jack was severely injured in that blast, and it was Free Spirit who sat with him in the grass until Fire Rescue could get on scene. Back at their Brooklyn Heights place, Cap told them he would die soon and requested they continue on with the Stars and Stripes emergency hotline program to keep helping people even after he was gone. And that was in 1995. Jack wouldn't be seen again for just over a decade, finally showing up in Thunderbolts when the Marvel Universe was embroiled in Civil War. Here we find that Jack had moved to Cleveland, Ohio, where he had met a lady named Lucy, fell in love, and settled down. During the Superhero Civil War, which resulted in the passing of the Superhero Registration Act, the SHRA, Jack refused to register, remembering the principles and ideals that Captain America had instilled in him. Lucy wanted Jack to throw away all his old gear and weapons. She didn't want him arrested and thrown in jail if that stuff was found. Despite that, one time Jack saw a lady being assaulted, and so he stepped in and saved her, but this put him on the radar of Norman Osborn's Thunderbolts team. The T-Bolts were dispatched to find him and bring him in, which resulted in them all fighting, and it was a bloody, brutal battle. Jack held his own against insurmountable odds, while Carlos Sofen, aka Moonstone, tried to make the damage from the battle look like it wasn't them, that it was Jack's fault, so media outlets would blame him and turn people against him. Jack tried to escape, but then Bullseye stabbed him and severed his caudal equina, which is a bundle of nerves on the lower end of the spinal cord that help with things like movement and feeling, and that rendered Jack paralyzed. The T-Bolts were then able to take Jack into custody because of all the damage that Jack 
had done. Swordsman continued to beat on Jack, angry that he had shattered his sword in the fight that they had just had. And so, in Civil War's battle damage report, Jack Flagg was flagged as an enemy combatant, enlisted as incarcerated. A couple years later, after the events of Annihilation, a fissure opened up in the fabric of space and time, and so, with guidance from Adam Warlock, Star-Lord put together a new Guardians of the Galaxy team. Jack was still in a wheelchair after what Bullseye did to him. He said for violating the SHRA, he and 100 other masks had to serve time at Fantasy Island, the initiative's Prison 42, which was built right inside the Negative Zone. That means he was there in the home of Annihilus and Blastar when Blastar and his army attacked Prison 42. The Warden and the COs all left and fled back to Earth through a portal, leaving Jack and the other inmates to fend for themselves and fight off this attack. However, it had been a non-stop attack going on six days in a row. Star-Lord came in to talk to Jack, forced to negotiate a surrender to Blastar, but instead, Star-Lord wanted to help them thwart Blastar. Jack's team wanted to open the portal that the Warden had used back to Earth, but Star-Lord told them not to do that, that if they opened it, that would give Blastar a direct line to Earth. So instead, he suggested calling in the rest of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Jack was forced to shoot a few of his own people who didn't like that idea too much. It was an inmate named Carrion, whom Peter and Jack had sent a telepathic message out for help, and that message was received by Mantis. Unfortunately, another inmate named Skeleton Key opened the portal to Earth, and Blastar was pleased. He was inside the prison now, and both Jack and Peter were surrounded. They both shot Blastar, and then Peter quickly wheeled Jack away. They held them off long enough for Rocket, Groot, Bug, Mantis, and Major Victory to show up to the battle. Jack was still wanted on Earth, so he didn't want to go back there through the portal, so instead he ended up at the Guardian's headquarters on Nowhere. The doctors there fixed his back, and suddenly Jack could walk again. He and Peter were starting to become fast friends, even as the space stuff was still growing on Jack. As the cosmic War of Kings was heating up between Black Bolt and Vulcan, Kree versus Shi'ar, the Guardians split to go talk to each side and attempt to cool the heat. And for that mission, Jack joined Star-Lord, Gamora, Phyla Vell, and Bug as the Kree team to go talk with Black Bolt in his royal court. But the talks failed. Medusa spoke on Black Bolt's behalf with a simple but firm no. Phyla Vell got pissed off and drew her sword on Medusa, and so the royal court, their Praetorian guard of Kree soldiers, surrounded them. Phyla got her sword to Crystal's neck, and they teleported back to nowhere with her. Unsurprisingly, Black Bolt, the Inhumans, and the Kree army pursued them and attacked, using Lockjaw to teleport right onto nowhere. And Jack ended up battling with Gorgon during the ensuing battle. Then Starhawk showed up, and she teleported them to Avengers Mansion in the year 3009 AD. This is when they ran into Vans Astro, Martin X, Charlie 27, and Yondu, a futuristic Guardians team. Flag hit Charlie 27, but then Jack was down with just one punch. Starhawk showed them how Black Belt was going to detonate a T-bomb, which would collapse all of space and time into nothingness. Cosmo and Mantis were made into babies while Star-Lord was an old man, however Jack seemingly wasn't affected, so it was on him to hold off their enemy in the tripod aliens. At the end, with everyone kind of confused about who was who and what was what, Starhawk gave Jack a big hug. It turns out that they were at the end of time and they got transported to a parallel universe, which is why things were different now and Killraven was leading the future Guardians team. And Starhawk had a big revelation for Jack. He said Jack was actually aging, but he was aging sideways through adjacent dimensions and that he was special. He was destined to reshape the universe universe, but could not say anymore. Jack was the chosen one. The catch, though, was he was steadily evaporating from reality. They then went to Avengers Mansion to attempt to get past a force field surrounding Doctor Doom's time machine. In Jack's diluted form, he could phase through the force field, disable the shield's generator from inside, and get the team to the time machine. Time was screwed up, though, and so they kept jumping timelines until they wound up on Magus' command vessel and headquarters of the Church of Universal Truth, the Sacrosanct. With Jack nearly faded away and hope seemingly lost, King the Conqueror showed up to take them to Limbo where they were all suddenly restored. Magus took out some of the Guardians, so Star-Lord used a cosmic cube to stop him just before putting a bullet right in Evil Warlock's face. Jack and the team were back on Nowhere where Moondragon woke up finally. After a survey team went into the fault, a creature from the Cancerverse returned and Moondragon was forced to take it into her womb. Jack wasn't sure Star-Lord's plan to fix this was going to work, but it had to. The Church of Universal Truth kidnapped Moondragon, so Jack and the team went to their planet for a rescue mission. Jack and the team took on the Truthers, and they won, rescuing Heather, aka Moondragon, in the process. Jack and the Guardians then went to Planet Hour, which was the former seat of the Galactic Council, before Vulcan atomized most of the Council members, and so the Guardians were there as a protective detail for the surviving delegates. The team soon transported to the Sacrosanct and continued their fight. Six years later, and Jack was now back on Earth, now working with Free Spirit again, along with Captain America, Sharon Carter, Director Maria Hill, and Rick Jones at S.H.I.E.L.D.
field. Jones said that he was excited to be relevant again, and he liked being more of a grounded street-level hero and not so much of a space adventurer. Cap, Free, and Jack ended up attacking Baron Zemo who'd popped up in a city called Bagalio. Captain America, who was working with Hydra, ended up double-crossing Jack, and Cap threw him out of Baron Zemo's jet just before he famously said, Hail Hydra. Jack fell to the concrete and landed on his head. Free Spirit ran to Jack as he lay lifeless in the street, but Jack wasn't breathing. They got him onto a shield ship where medics detected a faint pulse. Jack was in a coma in Shield Medical Bay after that, where his friends like Rick and Kathy came to talk to him, hoping he might be able to hear them, praying he might wake up. Cap was worried that if Jack woke up, it would expose his plot and connection to Red Skull and Hydra, so Dr. Selvig made a lethal injection for Hydra Cap to inject into the comatose Jack to kill him. And just as he was going to inject the drug into Jack's lines, Kathy showed up to tell them that they decided to take Jack off of life support. She was upset. The two of them were buddies, friends. They had history together. They were teammates. Jack would tell Kathy that his biggest dream was to be Cap's new Bucky, to live up to Captain America's ideals. Jack was a hero, a friend, a protector of America, and now he had died. They all went to Jack's funeral and gave him an honorable ceremony, grieving not just a hero, but grieving the loss of a friend. Jack did show up in the 2020 run on Guardians, though that was a flashback to when Philavelle lost her life. Jack also showed up as an NPC in the 2021 Guardians of the Galaxy team, and there he was a prisoner at the Rock, a Novacore prison base, where you could eject him into space and see him floating around the ship sometimes, and it's kind of like an easter egg slash bug where he suddenly shows up on board the Milano, the Guardian ship, to hang out with his friend Peter. Speaking of easter eggs, I'm off to go have a snack, so that's a wrap on this one my friends. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.